Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining NWC National Whistleblower Center for our first ever whistleblower chat. So if you don't know me, my name is Siri Nelson, and I'm the executive director at National Whistleblower Center. Um, we make it a priority to interact with the public and educate everyone about whistleblower issues, issues and laws because it affects everybody. No one's life goes untouched when whistleblowers speak for the truth and hold major corporations accountable. So during our whistleblower chats, you'll be hearing from whistleblowers, their attorneys, and other people that might be in the public eye, as well as have some saucy conversation about latest whistleblower developments, current events, and um, just general opinions coming from your very own executive director of National Whistleblower Center. <laughs> So if you're not familiar with our work, you can learn more at whistleblowers.org. And you can also join our mailing list there where you will get regular updates. You can also check out our Sunday read on LinkedIn and follow us on Instagram at National Whistleblower Center or at Twitter on, um, using the hashtag or sorry, using the handle Stop Fraud. Um, I'm really, really, really excited about today's conversation because I have some of my favorite people um, at the moment in this chat with me. So the first guests for our first ever whistleblower chat are Lindsay Golden, Exxon whistleblower and badass, and Neil Henriksen, whistleblower attorney, NWC supporter, and also another badass. So I'll hand it over to you two. Um, let's start with an introduction from Neil. Well, thank you, uh, Siri, and, and we thank the National Whistleblower Center for its work and its support, and especially in Lindsay, Lindsay's case, and she's also a co-plaintiff with, with another uh, former executive and scientist at ExxonMobil. And uh, we, we appreciate the amicus brief that was recently filed in the Third Circuit, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit. So my name's Neil Henriksen. I, I've been representing employees in labor and employment matters uh, for almost uh, 35 years. And uh, this uh, case you'll hear some about today with uh, ExxonMobil that uh, Lindsay uh, is uh, prosecuting is, you know, I, I would say one of the more interesting cases I've ever had in, in my career. But um, anyway, let me uh, turn it over to Lindsay. We, uh, again, I do uh, whistleblower uh, and employee representation throughout the uh, United States. We, we have offices in Washington, D.C., Florida, and in uh, New York. Uh, but uh, again, this is a great opportunity, and we think an important uh, a chat that uh, National Whistleblower Center is initiating, and very glad to be uh, some of the first guests on on your this effort. So I'll turn it over to Lindsay. Hello, folks. Um, hi, Siri. Hi, Neil. Uh, my name is Lindsay Golden. I am honored to be the first uh, whistleblower on these chats, and I'm the very lucky beneficiary of the, the good work of the National Whistleblower Center and of Neil Henriksen, um, one of the most badass attorneys you're ever going to meet. Um, so I'm looking forward to, to the discussion. Awesome. So happy to have you both here. We are going to get to your case after we cover a little bit of current affairs um, issues that have come up. So I really want to invite both of you to chime in with your opinions, your two cents, whatever you have um, in mind. So whistleblowers and whistleblowing is something that we see increasingly in mainstream media, whether it be in a music video, a song, um, whether it be in a true crime series or um, another type of venue, a TikTok, um, or people's LinkedIn posts, we see a lot of action around whistleblowing. So even recently with the Murray v. UBS case, where um, the determination in favor of the whistleblower was made, we saw the LinkedIn feeds of whistleblower attorneys across the board light up with announcements about this victory. And so um, we at NWC do our best to try and stay on top of these current events. Um, Murray happened last month, but more recently, 
we have some really good developments um, with Senator Grassley. So this week is Sunshine Week, which is an important week for um, recognizing transparency. And it's usually centered on FOIA requests. So that's Freedom of Information Act requests, which enable the public to collect information um, about activities in the government. And people can file these requests for lots of reasons. In fact, last year, NWC successfully filed a FOIA request because we wanted to better understand the basis for an article about how the Securities and Exchange Commission operates. Um, and as a result of that request, we now know that large firms are increasingly representing whistleblowers, except they want to do it in secret because they're simultaneously representing corporations. So we love attorneys like Neil Henriksen, who runs a small shop and really focuses on supporting and protecting whistleblowers. So you'll see on our website, we do have some whistleblower firms um, named, and those whistleblower firms are all firms that are trusted and smaller and not playing both sides of the field. So I have to give kudos to um, Neil while you're here on the call, especially after we use FOIA requests to find out that um, these major firms are secretly joining our ranks. Um, but FOIAs, again, have tons of different, very useful purposes. But one of them is to substantiate concerns brought forward by whistleblowers. And if you look at Senator Grassley's recently published video, which um, NWC will be circulating using our mailing list, so please sign up, he speaks directly to the utility of whistleblowers and the importance of protecting them and not retaliating against them in the government as a matter of free speech and government accountability. And so, you know, developments like that as we go towards National Whistleblower Day are really important. Lindsay and Neil, do you have any FOIA stories? Um, really more uh, FOIA uh, horror stories in terms of you know, making sure uh, really important documents get released by the government. But uh, I, 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 I think, you know, generally, of course, uh, you know, we all need to also consider state government, local government uh, requests for information. You know, for instance, uh, you know, in the state of Florida uh, has uh, should have uh we just had a change in Florida, but uh, Florida has one of the most robust public records laws requiring transparency in government. It's just been uh, limited to a, a, a minor degree, but in an important degree where the governor had, had uh, uh, tried to restrict certain documents and that did get passed through the legislature here. But we, you know, in addition to federal, Public records, state and local government public records are important, and they're important to whistleblowers and any member of the public. You don't have to be an attorney uh, can make a request for public records, and um, that includes the federal government. I don't actually have any FOIA stories. I try to be, believe it or not, I try to be legally boring. So... <laughs> You know what most whistleblowers do. That's the that's the terrifying part. You know, <laughs> it's usually the folks who who say, and I and I would love for you to talk more about this later. But the folks who have the least desire for attention end up being in the spotlight because they speak up about what's right. And we'll definitely talk about that more. Um, and Neil, you are so correct to highlight the fact that you know local FOIA rules are also important to recognize and to utilize. And the impact of the government not releasing important documents is critical to the successful enforcement of um, government oversight and accountability efforts. And that's really at the heart of what Senator Grassley is speaking to in his recent speech. So I encourage everyone to check that out. On a somber note, I'm sure we've all heard about the passing of John Barnett. John Barnett is a Boeing, was a Boeing whistleblower who raised concerns about quality control and safety issues at Boeing. He is current, he was currently, literally, days before his death and the day of his death, supposed to speak to these concerns in the process of an investigation and ongoing litigation in the matter. According to official reports, Mr. Barnett has succumbed to taking his own life. 
through self-inflicted wounds. However, we already are feeling the hints of controversy around this, the fear that in fact Exxon is behind Mr. Barnett's death. And whether these fears can be, be substantiated or not, they reflect the level of fear that whistleblowers experience when they speak up. So today, NWC is launching our campaign, advocating for Congress to investigate Boeing and let the corporation know that the end of John Barnett's life should not mean the end of the investigation into wrongdoing at Boeing. We cannot express our condolences enough. John Barnett is not the first whistleblower to succumb to depression or taking his own life, if that is in fact true. He is also not the first whistleblower to be killed in the process of trying to silence, if that is the case. However, NWC is here to help whistleblowers, to support them, to let them know they aren't alone, and to advocate for the more assertive investigation of their claims so that they can be vindicated and they can be protected from retaliation and rewarded where rewards are available. So please check out our website. Please take action to tell Congress that Boeing needs to be held accountable, whether John Barnett is here to push for more accountability or not, and reinforce the reality that traveler safety and airline safety should be paramount and should always take precedent over profits for airlines. The crux of John Barnett's complaint is that Boeing put profits first and safety second. And I'm sure that no one who travels in an airline as a passenger or even as a pilot wants that reality to negatively impact their life. So um, our condolences to him and his family, but also our call to action that these allegations need to continue to be investigated. And a warning to anyone who is afraid that the conspiracies are true, just know that you know reporting anonymously is a great avenue. NWC has lots of pages about that. And any conspiracy theories have not been substantiated. And we really truly hope that they won't be and that, that the truth is that this unfortunately was a self-inflicted death. Um, I don't really think there's a hot take on this other than that whistleblowing continues to be scary and dangerous and really impacting our lives um, when we choose to speak up. I wonder, Neil and Lindsay, if either of you could speak to your personal experiences firsthand with seeing the struggles, not just of yourself as being a part of the whistleblowing world, but also things that you've now heard as people who are exposed to other whistleblower stories. Well, look, let, let me uh, say one, one thing uh, about the value, again, of the National Whistleblower Center. You know, one of the things I've seen uh, representing employees uh, is, you know, people feel alone in, in their uh, sort of David versus Goliath struggles against, uh, you know, big companies uh, and uh, knowing that there are others who uh, support their endeavors uh, of of doing the right thing, and that there's a community of people uh, who have experienced the same things they have done and sort of come out the other end after uh, dealing with the the really intense stress that could come up in the course of litigation and and dealing with governmental entities. It, you know, that's one of the the, the real uh, benefits of having a community uh, and resources that uh, National Whistleblower Center, you know, demonstrates. And we do know, um, I, I think, uh, some colleagues I've seen on face uh, on on LinkedIn, you know, have have demonstrated uh, the importance of uh, taking into account the stress that goes with whistleblowing. And there've been studies and and work trying to provide some kind of uh, relief and, and again, a sense of community and someone not feeling alone 
out there as the only one, you know, uh, putting up uh, a fight to to really see uh, the right thing done. So, I, I'll I'll echo that. Um, I think personally, I'm I have the good fortune to have a, a very supportive uh, family, and the simple fact that uh, Exxon Mobil chose to fire two of us <laughs> does provide some uh, dare I say camaraderie. Um, in the experience, but but without a doubt, the existence of the National Whistleblower Center um, and the support of attorneys um, with the chops, such as strong chops that Neil has, is, is really what makes a difference. I'm so sorry. I keep on muting myself so you don't hear background of that I can't get it on mute. <laughs> So I think, I, I mean, the points that you two raised are exactly what we consistently hear. Um, and I'm so happy you two have been able to work together and I'm grateful to hear you have the support you need, Lindsay. Um, you're doing amazing work and, and we're behind you 100%. And, and I'm just so excited to have you and hear more about your story um, as this conversation continues. So um, NWC is an organization that can help whistleblowers find assistance. Um, I saw in the chat that there are, are folks looking for assistance and the best way you can obtain that help is by going to whistleblowers.org and clicking on the get help link and filling out the intake form. So NWC has something called the attorney referral program. And in the attorney referral program, we have a group of attorneys. Um, Neil is a part of the program if you wanna work with him. And we also have attorneys with a whole lot of other subject matter um, expertise. And we are currently recruiting attorneys. So if you're an attorney watching this and you're in New York, in Texas, in Montana, um, in Kentucky, we really need attorneys from these states. So you can check out the Find an Attorney page and also the Attorney Referral Program page to learn more about that. If you need help, the best way to get it is filling out the Get Help form. And um, also today, NWC published a press release. In that press release, there's a link to a helpline for folks who are struggling with contemplating self-harm. Um, we really hope that everyone in this audience is feeling safe, but if you are not, please use that resource. Um, you know, NWC does encourage folks to put yourself first when you're thinking about blowing the whistle. Think about your social circle, think about your connections. Today I was featured in an article um, published at The Markup that is about the experiences of Black women whistleblowers, which is wonderful because we just wrapped Black History Month and we're currently in Women's History Month. We have a Women Whistleblowers webpage up at National Whistleblower Center that I'm very proud of. And in Washington, D.C., um, National Whistleblower Center will be hosting a trivia night at Sud House on March 20th at 6 p.m. That is all about women and women's history and women whistleblowers. And so we really encourage people to check out that Eventbrite page and follow us on LinkedIn to get updates about these events that we have every month. Well, next month, we will be focusing on um, climate whistleblowers and we'll definitely be including some questions about Lindsay and her whistleblowing. Um, so check out the markup article, sign up at Eventbrite um, and definitely find help and support if you need it before taking further steps to blow the whistle. Um, Lindsay, how difficult was it for you to find the legal representation that you needed? So that's a good question. Um, I actually saw a post um, on social media by, by the former um, director of, of the National Whistleblower Center. So, uh, John Kostiak, and I, on a bit of a lark, I sent him a, a message saying, hi, I think I need your help. <laughs> and he, to his great credit, uh, took me seriously and directed me to the, the, the larger team. Um, and, and from there, you guys were able to connect me with Neil. Um, and four years later, here we are. <laughs> <laughs> That's so amazing, Lindsay. I'm so happy we were able to help you. Thank you for sharing that. That's that's awesome. Um, Neil, what is it like for you kind of 
fielding whistleblower inquiries and, and trying to figure out whether or not you can help someone? Well, I, I think there's so, uh, there, there are many issues that, uh, you know, folks have come to uh, come to the table with when they they approach an attorney of, about the uh, workplace situation, and uh, because we live in a world of uh, at will employment, right? There, there's uh, really having legal protection as a whistleblower uh, is, in a, some ways, the exception because of the nature of the laws in our country. And uh, so I, I'm. Uh, it, it's always interesting uh, to me that I think most of us feel, hey, I've uh, done something uh, to deal with wrongful behavior in the workplace. Uh, and uh, sometimes folks don't have the kind of legal protection uh, they'd expect, or uh, time has passed uh, because there's some short uh, timing requirements for certain protections. So one, uh, you know, I, I think when someone's looking for legal representation uh, is reaching out to attorneys as, as promptly as, as they can, uh, even though it, it it you might never have had experience dealing with the legal system, it's important because the nature of some of these laws require reporting uh, immediately for someone to have protections under law. Um, two, uh, looking for experienced attorneys in uh, the field uh, of labor and employment, and uh, there's so many different types of uh, statutes, both federal, state, local laws that apply, uh, and uh, it's it, it, when you have someone who has had a focus on the practice area of representing employees, uh, they they know not maybe not off the top of their head, but know that uh, certain activities of employers directed at an employee who's uh, reported wrongdoing you know, could be protected or, you know, know where to look uh, for for that kind of protection. Uh, because I think most lawyers have uh, an understanding of employment at will and, and, and sometimes throwing the towel maybe a little too soon or don't think about the broader issues. Um, just because it, there's just so much out there uh, and and maybe this is a good pitch, Siri, for you know one of the resources uh, of of one of your founders of the National Whistleblower Center. But um, anyway, I I think uh, you know there are just a, a lot of legal uh, technicalities uh, related to whistleblower claims. So it's important people, uh, even if they're feeling somewhat reluctant to to reach out uh, and and reach out sooner rather than later because there could be timing issues that you know might render seeking advice uh too late you know what neil you couldn't have set me up better to promote steve cohn's book okay so first i want to say everything you just shared is completely what i want people to hear so thank you for explaining the importance of finding an experienced whistleblower attorney someone who knows beyond employment law, but actually the nitty gritty nuances of what whistleblowers need to show when they need to show it and what's at stake rather than just the kind of basic facial um, employment at will dynamic. Um, so thank you for that. But also for those who cannot find an attorney are not ready to contact an attorney, we have heard a lot of positive feedback about Stephen Cohn's book, Rules for Whistleblowers. It's pretty much the second edition of the Whistleblower's Handbook, which has served so many whistleblowers in their efforts to first um, figure out if they have a case and then decide what steps to take next um, in their whistleblower journey. This book covers a lot of refreshed information about um, you know, international whistleblower issues, transnational enforcement, 
rights um, and laws that have changed since the first edition came out in uh, 2015. So this book is an amazing resource. And as Neil said, finding the right attorney is also a very, very important step. Um, Lindsay can testify to that. And anybody who donates over $50 to National Whistleblower Center will receive an offer to have a copy of this book. So please donate today and look out for this book at your local bookstore. Now, we'll briefly mention some of the things we're covering in current events that we'll probably discuss in the future as there's more development. So the Southern District of New York has established a pilot program for whistleblowers and so has the Department of Justice. These two programs are very interesting and have been criticized. So if you check out Whistleblower Network News, you'll see some coverage of those critiques. The SEC also recently established their climate rules, um, their climate reporting rules, which um, Allison Lee, former commissioner, has criticized as well. And you can find more about that at Whistleblower Network News. NWC is an advocate for the best, strongest laws to protect whistleblowers and incentivize them to come forward. So we're watching these programs closely. We're also continuing on our seven campaigns of the year, which feature an emphasis on pressuring the Treasury Department to actually enact rules for their anti-money laundering program, which is critical to enabling whistleblowers to stop the money laundering that funds oligarchs and other international criminals who disrupt our democracy. So with those final closing points on um, current events, let's turn to the main course. Neil and Lindsay's story. So to give some background, as we mentioned earlier, this is a story that centers on wrongdoing at a major corporation, Exxon. We're all impacted by Exxon's activities. Their different business functions impact our economy. So even if you don't drive and you don't think you rely on oil, you are still impacted by what happens at Exxon and what happens to Exxon employees. In fact, this rule that is currently being litigated in this case impacts all employees at private companies under the Sarbanes-Oxley Act. So Lindsay, um, you've covered a little bit about your whistleblowing story, but it would be really great to hear your firsthand journey from witnessing um, things that concerned you to actually starting to work with someone like Neil and pursuing action. Sure. Um, so, for, for those of you who want the long and, and detailed story, the, the Washington Post summary um, actually does give, uh, give the gist, but here I'll give the 30,000 foot overview of that. Um, as part of my job uh, at ExxonMobil, I became aware that um, management was uh, essentially cooking the books by using a assumption about the speed at which oil rig drilling would increase. Um, along with my fellow uh, complainant, Damien Birch, um, I reported this internally. Uh, and at the time that I did that, um, I genuinely believed that ExxonMobil was going to police itself. Um, now, I knew that ExxonMobil was kind of, a, you know, BMS, a very slow to act corporation. Um, so I wasn't expecting instantaneous results, but I, I was expecting that when someone stands up and says, hey, by the way, maybe we should stop violating the law, um, that, that they would actually police um, the situation. Uh, that turned out to be over optimistic. Um, and Fast forward several months later, uh, when the issue at hand um, was obliquely referenced in um, an article in the Wall Street Journal, both my fellow uh, complainant, Damian Birch, and I um, found ourselves uh, fired. Now, probably about 200 people internally knew about this particular um, fraud, so they, they knew that um, in the Permian Basin, uh, the management was um, directing use of a, a non-physical um, learning curve assumption. Um, however, the only two people who were fired <laughs> were the only two people who had actually reported it. Um, so 
that just honestly, that just, I'm like, you, you can't do that. So um, I, I realized that if I didn't stand up and say, hey, not right, that they would get away with it and be able to do it in a much more broad reaching um, situation. Um, I also, I'm, I'm actually a trained uh, climate scientist. So my, my PhD is, was looking um, in, a, in a geoscience department with a focus on, on climate. Um, and it really hit me that if ExxonMobil was willing to fire me over $10 billion, which, you know, that, that, that sounds like, that sounds like a crazy large amount of money, but it, it's not a bankrupting amount of money for ExxonMobil. Um, if they were willing to fire me over $10 billion, I realized that we simply as a society cannot trust them um, to be an honest broker when it comes to the energy transition. And so I realized that I had to stand up. Um, so Damien, fortunately, is uh, uh, another matter of fact sort of individual. Um, and so he and I, with the help of the Whistleblower Center and Neil, um, have been advancing this one day at a time. Thank you for sharing, Lindsay. Um, your discussion of your observations at Exxon really inspired me to ask more about you before Exxon. How did you, what, I know it took a lot of work to get to that role. <laughs> what inspired you to go into that space? Like tell, please share like that, um, Lindsay becoming grown up Lindsay story. I'd love to hear. <laughs> yeah, well, let's just put it this way. Uh, in my high school yearbook, the tagline underneath my photo was not most likely to be fired by a fortune 100 company. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so wasn't really in the plan. Um, I, I actually did not even intend to work for oil and gas. So I, I went um, I went back to grad school. Uh, I was interested in earth science and, and climate science. Um, and over the course of my time there, I realized that perhaps academia was not really quite where I wanted to be because I wanted to have an impact on day-to-day on -day decisions. Mm -hmm. um, and I went to oil and gas, specifically ExxonMobil, um, after being recruited in 2008, 2009, which at that point they were talking a really good talk about the energy transition and I hadn't yep. talked to someone like me. <laughs> um, so I actually took them at their word, Yeah, uh, which was perhaps the worst mistake. Oh, that's so far to date the worst mistake I've made in my life. Um, mm. I mean, I have hopefully have plenty of time left to make new mistakes, <laughs> but, but yeah, that was that mistake. Yeah. Um, so I actually believed that they were wanted to, to use the company strategy to actually shift into being an energy company as opposed to a petroleum extraction. Right. Right. Um, turns out that's not actually true. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and yeah, so I, I I did really enjoy working at Exxon. Exxon is a, a full of very intelligent. Um, very um, hardworking people. Yeah. Um, so it was, it was, it, uh, I served as a useful idiot basically for, for a solid um, 10, actually more than that, years uh, there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think you're, you're being a bit hard on yourself, but I get where you're coming from. Um, tons of whistleblowers, especially in these major corporations where they obfuscate what's really going on, there's tons of layers of formality and, and business structure that keep people from the truth, especially at the recruiting stage, you know, then you get your job. All you want to do is do the best job you can, right? I mean, that's one really strong quality between all the whistleblowers I talk to is, you know, whistleblowers are people who do the best job they can. And then in the process of that, they find out that their company that they work for isn't exactly doing the best job they can. And <laughs> That's a really unfortunate discovery. Um, Darlan Chang, actually, um, an advocate that we've worked with in the past, was similarly, um, you know, mis misled. 
by Exxon with the same types of representations. And he realized in time that that it wasn't true. And he went forward to now be a leader in developing Greek communities and speaking out against Exxon. So he's really cool. But, you know, if, if someone can, if someone as smart as you and Darlan could, could be misled that way, it could happen to anyone. So, and it happens, yeah. No, you're, you're, you're right. Um, I, I do like to do the best job that I can. And if ExxonMobil is watching, I'm going to do the very best job I can in holding you accountable. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. I mean, so let's, <laughs> and you're proving it in court. You are proving it in court. You're fighting so tenaciously. And, and I want to hear from Neil about that legal strategy. How does this fight happen? What steps have you taken so far? Um, what are some preliminary questions you've had to ask as, a, as an attorney working with a client in such a unique position? Um, I'd love to hear. I mean, you have the benefit of someone who is actually willing to fight the fight. Sometimes clients aren't. Sometimes they're like, I'm going to stop here. It's enough. And I love seeing that for you, it's not enough. Um, so the fight continues. And, and Neil, please share about what that looks like. Sure. Well, so uh, Lindsay's being a little bit um uh, it, 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 uh, uh modest in in her uh recitation of uh, the experience both her and her colleague who are involved in this matter are you know really uh very serious scientists uh with both have phds and um you know we're very loyal uh, employees of exxon and uh, wanted to see and you know the company and, and the culture that they uh, had in in a lot of ways adopted in terms of wanting to do the right thing uh, within the company and had disclosed uh, uh, errors that would uh, impact the financial condition of the company, how shareholders, uh, of this publicly traded company would respond. Uh, and it was, you know, over $10 billion type of errors. Um, but uh, thinking, you know, the company would do the right thing, uh, they reported it, they made it known throughout the company. And then when uh, some of that information became uh, publicly available to investors and, and the public at large through a Wall Street Journal article, uh, they were soon after terminated. So their case began uh, with a whistleblower complaint under the Sarbanes-Oxley Act uh, that uh, is to protect uh, people in public companies, publicly traded companies, from being retaliated against for uh, raising and objecting to practices uh, that would affect investors, that would affect uh, people uh, who are uh, subject to losing money because of this fraud. I mean, that's, again, when I talked earlier about limited protection. So in this instance, uh, they were covered, and, and to initiate that, they filed with the Department of Labor Agency, OSHA, and had raised their complaint, and OSHA then uh, began a vigorous investigation. You know, I was involved, you know, at the beginning of this and with them, and uh, they uh, very, very sharp people, very technical issues in part involved, and uh, they provided that kind of information. And OSHA had a top-notch investigator involved who uh, interviewed uh, both uh, Lindsay and her colleague, and many, many other witnesses and and. Uh, folks involved, uh, interviewed and dealt with getting responses from the company. And so really had, uh, you know, their mandate isn't just to take one side, it's to look at the entirety and the context of the, the issues. And they did that. And after almost a year long investigation found reasonable cause to believe uh, that there was unlawful uh, retaliation that occurred and uh, came up uh, with a finding uh, that uh, determined that Lindsay and her colleague were wrongfully terminated for retaliatory reasons, awarded them very substantial damages, and then awarded some things that has us in court right now. Uh, uh, some non-economic 
uh, relief was provided because of the seriousness of uh, the reasonable cause finding by the Department of Labor. So ExxonMobil had a post, uh, and we don't know if this occurred, uh, make postings advising other uh, workers uh, about uh, the situation and that they shouldn't retaliate. And Lindsay and her colleague uh, received uh, what's called reinstatement order, preliminary reinstatement order. And, the, and ExxonMobil was required under the Sarbanes-Oxley Act to reinstate preliminarily, right, reinstate Lindsay and her colleague to their original positions and make whole relief, all back pay um, uh, because their terminations from these, you know, high level positions, uh, you know, you uh, upset someone's economic life, paying your mortgage, paying, you know, you, the bills everyone has, utilities in their life and, uh, you know, knocking someone out of a job for unlawful reasons that one, one good thing about this law is the make whole relief provisions. And so um, they were ordered to do that. Uh, and the law provides it that even if there's an objection to the underlying reasonable cause finding of the reason for termination, the, the whistleblower uh, is still entitled to preliminary reinstatement unless there's a stay of that order by the Department of Labor, and Exxon did not seek a stay of that order, but just ignored the reinstatement or refused to uh, reinstatement, uh, reinstate both of them uh, to their positions. And uh, that led to separate litigation outside of uh, the um, the Department of Labor process, it led to uh, going to U United States District Court, in this case in New Jersey, which is the incorporating state of Standard Oil, ExxonMobil. And uh, a very interesting thing happened. The court said, well, we don't know if we have jurisdiction under the Sarbanes-Oxley Act. And this goes to some very technical legal issues, but important legal issues, because uh, you know, we all know Sarbanes-Oxley Act uh, and, and Dodd-Frank came all come up in the context of some of the most egregious corporate fraud that ever occurred. Enron uh, and the loss to uh, the public shareholders, employees. And so the uh, Enron impetus, in a way, to and work of public interest groups like National Whistleblower Center and those involved with it and getting Sarbanes-Oxley passed through Congress and, and having it signed into law uh, really was a process of, you know, they say the making of the sausage of uh, passing these laws. And, and part of the statute provided a reference to the law that Mr. Uh, uh, Barnett from Boeing uh, it was involved with Air 21, which dealt with airline safety. And one of the provisions, you know, is this preliminary reinstatement provision. And so right now, uh, Lindsay and her colleague are, are really at the forefront of helping clarify what is somewhat murky in the law uh, and that the courts uh, are having, uh, you know, a challenge looking at uh, how this uh, important law and an important piece of relief uh, can uh, be maintained. And so preliminary reinstatement, which requires the company to put the employee back to work, pay them the back pay their own, and let them proceed uh, with their pos position with full seniority, uh, that's the issue being litigated. It's been litigated in other courts and you have some courts that have found that the, the federal courts can enforce it. Others have not. They've been split decisions. So they're in a very important battle uh, to make sure that the law is properly enforced in the way I think it's clear it was intended to protect those blowing the whistle. And, um, you, you know, we appreciate we had the Department of Labor uh, filed an amicus brief in support of uh, the position of Lindsay and her colleague of our position, the National Whistleblower Center. Uh, and thank you, Siri, for your work on that as well. Filed a, a friend of the court brief 
uh, and in on Exxon side, the Cham United States Chamber of Commerce uh, filed a brief on behalf of a number of manufacturing associations uh, in support of Exxon's position that that, that they could uh, disregard the preliminary reinstatement order, and that was uh, something that the courts. Uh, it, we our recent argument just last week before the United States Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit. You know, one of the 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 most pressing questions for uh, the judges on the panel. We had a three judge panel considering these issues. Was how can a company just disregard? an order of the Department of Labor like this preliminary reinstatement order in effect uh, set the terms of their own stay um, and, and you know, get away with it. But those issues are very complicated issues and are still going on. Wow. What a great legal overview, Neil. Thank you so much. Um, you know, this case has so many nuances. It started out as, you know, employees raising concerns about misrepresentations, um, that that really primarily affected investors and 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 concerned the integrity of a corporation that um, is having a major climate impact. Then it became about whistleblower retaliation. Now it's about the interpretation of one of the most important whistleblower laws in one of the most important jurisdictions, because the Third Circuit is where we have much of the corporations incorporated. Right, that's where they're based in Delaware, and that's what this court is is making a lot of decisions about. So to help the people who are in our audience understand a little bit better, Emil, what is actually the significance of preliminary reinstatement? You you kind of, we definitely dived into that in our in our amicus brief, and you kind of touched on the the um you know the different aspects of preliminary reinstatement, but why is it important? What does it mean? Why was it included in SOX? Sure. Well, that's a great. Great question. And and so I think there's two aspects of it that are important. One is personal to the whistleblower, uh, who who uh you know, just think of someone who is uh working in the C suite, uh learns of fraud and let let's say they're and they're not making, you know, the uh the money that the chief operating officer or the CEO are making. Um might maybe an administrative assistant and learns of corporate fraud, blows the whistle on that, and uh, is immediately terminated. Uh, they might not have the family support, the resources. Uh, you might have a single parent, you know, supporting a family. Uh, but uh, and and that's not to diminish anyone else, but just to kind of highlight the importance for the whistleblower of having that kind of financial. Uh, relief where the company is required, you, you know, to before everything is fully played out. Uh, the, I think Congress and I, I, I know the courts have recognized this, uh, although not all judges have recognized this, that that kind of financial relief while the whistleblowing case is ongoing uh, could mean, you know, foreclosure or not. It could mean uh, public assistance or not. It can mean uh, being able to function in, in you know, one's economic life uh, or not. And so for the whistleblower, that's important. The other aspect of, of preliminary reinstatement is it's the intent of Congress. Uh, I believe when you look at the comments and, and hear about the uh, the committee discussions that went on when Sarbanes-Oxley uh, was passed is getting someone who has the gumption to step out and call out a wrongdoing is important to get them back in the workplace so that they're uh, providing protection to the public by being back in the workplace and balancing a large corporation, putting someone back uh, to work and and maybe uh, the full litigation of a matter hasn't taken place, but it's all based on the only way that the Department of Labor through OSHA could have ordered, uh, in this case, Lindsay and her colleague back to work is if they had found after a rigorous investigation, after providing the company due process, uh, 
a reasonable cause finding that there was a violation of law, that they were entitled to relief. So it's not, hey, we just automatically put someone back to work while the process plays out. It's that this was rigorously investigated uh, and that there's been a finding in favor of Lindsay and her colleague uh, for a reasonable cause to believe a violation of the statute. So they're entitled to this kind of relief. And so this public interest uh, aspect of preliminary reinstatement, where it's protecting uh, investors and the public at large by having the whistleblower back in the workplace, who uh, is presumably uh, you know, not going to be deterred from uh, doing the right thing and reporting wrongdoing. Really good overview of the analysis. It's like, simply put, this is important because whistleblowers need income just like everybody else, and they don't deserve to be deprived of that, especially when it's already been found that there is some grounds for their protection. And whistleblowers are great when they get to keep their jobs because they can keep watching and keep holding that corporation accountable. And also, you know, in terms of how it affects other employees, right? It's something that shows the message that you can speak up and come back to work the next day. Lindsay, I want to turn to you now as we get towards the end of our conversation. What would it have meant for you if Exxon complied with the preliminary reinstatement order? Oh, that's a very interesting question. Um, I think that would show uh, that ExxonMobil respects the rule of law. Um, I think it would show that ExxonMobil is willing to accept responsibility for their uh, unfortunate <laughs> past mistakes, uh, and it would send a message to shareholders and, and the public uh, that they can be trusted. Um, the fact that they didn't, I mean, as a citizen, I find it, my opinion is that it takes a certain level of hubris to ignore an order from the US government. Um, and I want corporations and everyone to respect the rule of law. So um, I suppose. <laughs> That's powerful. That's really powerful. And I'm so happy to hear it coming from you. Um, so, so we've touched on this a little bit earlier, you know, this experience has thrust you into the spotlight. Here you are on a LinkedIn Live. Um, <laughs> doing a great job, by the way. It's wonderful to hear from you. You recently went viral with an amazing post that clearly drew a connection between the wrongdoing you observed and the lack of um, trustworthiness that Exxon, and as you now highlight again, you know, showing a disregard for rule of law. How can we trust them when it comes to energy commitments? How do you feel about this new spotlight, this new platform you have? Uh, well, yeah, I, I, I likes are one thing, votes are another. <laughs> um, so I was actually attempting to talk to my friends on the inside. I, I still do have a few. Uh, get Exxon Mobil with that post um, and basically say, hey, think about what your company is doing. If, if they're willing to fire me over this, you, you can't trust what they're saying about the energy transition. Um, and the, it turns out that I actually reached a much larger audience than I thought, but that actually heartens me because I think people are really starting to focus on the fact that having oil and gas have their influence uh, pervasively. So through university funding, through um, funding of national labs, through influences on the media, basically through extensive lobbying um, of people up and down, local all the way up to, to federal officials, that that shifts the public conversation um, in a way that is not really in the public interest. Um, and I think people, um, my, my hope is that enough people will kind of wake up and recognize 
that there are a few folks at the top of ExxonMobil and likely others, although I can't speak to others, um, who are trying to delay what is an existential crisis. The, the, uh, they're trying to delay society addressing an existential crisis um, to line their pocketbooks, I suppose, uh, and that we can't let them. Um, so I'm hoping people will hear this message, take a step back and say, ah, oh, wait a minute, <laughs> what's really going on? And um, start demanding that our institutions take action, uh, take substantive, deliberate, full throttle action to confront climate change. Um, so, I don't know, I, I, I'm not really someone who relishes the spotlight, <laughs> but if it has to be showed up, if that, if that will help move the needle on climate change, move the needle on rule of law issues, move the needle on corporate governance, move the needle literally on democracy. If, if that will help move the needle, then put the spotlight on me. Wow. Continuously courageous, Lindsay. Your tenacity is, is very impressive. I'm so happy you're working with Neil. What are you, what are you gonna add? I, I see you about to say, say, say it. At the, 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 I, I don't really see it as courageous. So people keep going, oh, that's so brave. And, and I kind of, thank you, I appreciate that. Um, I, I see it a little differently. Uh, I, I have two choices, really only two. Choice one is just keep my mouth shut, don't say anything, hope that ExxonMobil doesn't try to damage my reputation or further drain my pocketbook or whatever. And I have the other option, which is to point out what I can speak with authority to say which is, hey, by the way, they're not being honest and this has major implications for society. Now, this one, that's good for the short term and maybe I would protect my pocketbook and maybe I won't get mudslinging, but it's not good for my daughter. It's a really risky move for my daughter because she's gonna be alive hopefully decades from now. <laughs> and if we just delay this much longer, it's not gonna be a good situation. So really, saying what I know is actually the safest bet of those two bad options. So I'm choosing the safer bet. Um, so it, it's one of those things where people go, oh, that's crazy. No, no, I, I'm choosing, it's kind of like voting for the, the least bad of the two alternatives. I'll go with the least bad. Yeah, um, well said. Yes, yeah, um, that's a good insight. That's a really great, and, I, and we hear that from a lot of whistleblowers. You know, when we say the word courageous, there's a lot of like, Visceral reaction. I got to be courageous. I'm not the hero. <laughs> wow. But you know, your analysis is it's so easy to understand. You know, it's not a question of courage. It's a question of looking at the looking at the situation plainly. You know, you know, what is the future? What, what is the impact here? Is it truly courageous to to just simply do the right thing, knowing that? The ultimate outcome, like you said, is safer. And that's what so many whistleblowers are speaking to. And just reminds me of John Burnett. You know, the safer step is to make sure that faulty pieces aren't being used in airplanes. Like that's just the safer bet. Um, but you know, unfortunately, companies like Exxon, you know, they aren't brave, they aren't doing the right thing, they aren't courageous, they are not thinking in long term what's better for everyone because you can pull as much oil as you want out of the ground. But that will protect all the customers that you need to buy that oil tomorrow. And, um, you know, wrapping it up with that, I mean, we could talk forever. I would love to talk more as this case progresses and continue to support you. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for educating the public. Thank you for doing the safe thing, the smart thing, for speaking up and having your support network behind you. Um, you know, you can always find out about whistleblower issues by looking at whistleblowers.org or checking out whistleblower network news at whistleblowersblog.com. Um, and also, um, you know, Lindsay, is there anything you want to share about people learning more about your journey, following your updates? Um, you know? You're like, no, no acceptable <laughs> option there. <laughs> Name and find plenty of stories about her. <laughs> uh, I, if you know of a way I can help, let me know. You can find me on LinkedIn. <laughs> That's wonderful. And Neil, any closing remarks? 
No, I mean, just keep up the good work at the National Whistleblower Center and, you know, presenting information to the public. And, and you know, again, I think uh, people having a sense that they're not alone in in addressing, you know, what are very important issues. And we all know, as someone who, you know, I try cases to juries, you know, in addition to administrative matters, et cetera, financial sector matters. And it's so important. Everyone knows, you know, we, people who uh, care about their work, uh, people who put, you know, blood, sweat and tears into what they do for a living. Uh, you know, when uh, it, it takes a lot to speak up and feeling like you're not the only one on an island doing that uh, is important and, and why, you know, NWC's mission and information on the website, et cetera, is very important. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for all those kudos. And, you know, let's continue the fight. Let's continue the discussion. Let's talk more. Um, you can follow us on Instagram at National Whistleblower Center, on Twitter at Stop Fraud, and you can subscribe to our mailing list at whistleblowers.org. So thank you for a wonderful and way better than I thought it would be whistleblower chat. <laughs> you two rock. And can't wait to hear more about your case and continue supporting you. Have thank a great you. day. Take care. Bye-bye.